Regaku, take one. The tables have turned. You're no longer at the mercy of the crystallization gods or being able to generate single crystals that are amenable to the technique. So rather than relying on pot luck uh, and being able to get a structure that is, ex exemplifies what you're working on, uh, you're able to get a range of crystal structures that really cover the space that you're working in. I'm Simon Coles uh, and I'm a professor of structural chemistry here at the University of Southampton in the UK. I'm also uh, the director of the National Crystallography Service, which is a high-powered facility um, funded to look at samples that uh, can't be investigated on conventional um, home laboratory sources. Uh, and so we collaborate with colleagues all across the country um, to look at their toughest problems. How have advances in diffractometers and core technologies driven scientific progress? Crystallography came of age in the 1960s, um, but at that point it was a very manual uh, technique. It took weeks to get results. In the 1970s, it was possible to hook up computers to diffractometers and automate them at the process of collecting data. And that caused a big step change in the, the throughput uh, of crystallographic facilities. It wasn't until the late 80s when uh, attention turned to increasing the capability of the hardware uh, of diffractometers and that's when there was a step change in terms of the, the kind of science that was enabled. The introduction of more powerful x-ray sources, uh, area detectors for small molecule crystallography. Then we were able to get through a lot more samples. We shifted from being able to measure something like one sample every three or four days to get, getting three um, measured in one single day uh, and routinely operate in that way. So we were able to cover a lot more um, territory, um, run a lot more samples, but the introduction of more higher powered um, facilities meant that we were able to begin to look at different kinds of chemistry. So at that early stage, we were able to achieve a whole lot more chemistry or cover a whole lot more chemistry simply because of the power of the instrumentation. Why did you adopt rotating anode X-ray technology early in your career? It was the potential uh, of this instrumentation. It was clear that it was hugely powerful. Uh, it needed to be developed further. Um, and we took inspiration from what our cousins in protein crystallography were doing. Uh, they were able to look at very weakly scattering um, samples um, and, and get you know, viable results out of them and I could see a parallel in what we were doing. We were getting more and more challenging samples that uh, were weakly scattering and therefore it was clearly the obvious way to go was to get a more, uh, the most powerful um, home lab x-ray source that we could. How have modern rotating anode sources improved in performance and usability? In the early days, rotating anodes were uh, wasting quite a lot of their potential um, and there have been uh, developments in optics which enable us to take more of the flux coming off the source and focus it on the sample. Um, introduction of those meant uh, there was you know, five times more intensity on our sample um, from the same, very same x-ray source. Um, and detectors enabling us to detect more that's coming off the sample, um, th those have taken a couple of step changes, but the introduction of HPC detectors more recently, as a, with, with very, very little noise, has enabled us to see a lot more that's coming off the, the, the source, off the crystal. Um, so that has enabled a, a whole step change in terms of the, the throughput, which has opened up also um, different new areas of chemistry uh, which previously weren't accessible to the technique. How do rotating anode sources complement or substitute for synchrotron radiation? Now, with these advances in, uh, in hardware technology, the gap has narrowed almost to nothing. If we do not see any diffraction um, here at our home sources in Southampton, we probably almost certainly won't see any diffraction at the diamond light source where we now go. What advantages do rotating anode sources offer for solving challenging crystal structures? The likelihood is, even when you're entering into a challenging research project, that you'll be able to get several crystal structures out of your work. So rather than relying on pot luck uh, and being able to get a structure that is, ex exemplifies what you're working on, uh, you're able to get a range of crystal structures that really cover the space that you're working in. What would you say to researchers concerned about the higher cost of rotating anode systems? 
I think it's really important to consider these systems alongside the other kinds of central facilities that we have in chemistry departments, for example, Solution State NMR. The cost of these instruments is pretty comparable these days, um, yet from crystallography you will get an unambiguous answer um, with very, very high levels of, of structural information in it. Um, so given that the, the easy to run and maintain these days. They're very, very comparable facilities. And so um, when you think about the amount of information you get per pound or dollar or yen spent, um, it's, you get far more um, out of uh, a rotating anode X-ray source than some of the more um, sporting um, spectroscopic methods.